Hi everybody and welcome to another digital piano review here at Marion Pianos. Today we are taking a look at Casio's PX870. It's a wonderful instrument in the $1,000 to $2,000 category, weighted 88 note piano with great sound. It's the first time I've had a chance to have a really up close look at it. Has been out on the market for a year or so, uh, but it's new to us, which means maybe it's new to you. Anyway, we're going to be talking about the sound and the action and some of the features that it offers, do a little bit of playing on it for you as well. And we certainly hope that you enjoy it and it helps your shopping process. If it's the first time that you have been to the channel, if it's the first time you were meeting us here at Miriam Pianos, we would really love if you subscribed. It's so much fun to have this ever-growing community of piano lovers interact, share comments, uh, and just uh, you know trade tidbits on what it means to own a piano and shop for one in a more effective way. So, uh, without further ado, let's get started with Casio's PX870 right away. So the PX870 sits actually right at the very top of the Casio PX lineup. So there are several models uh, below this. There's the PX770, there's a PX780, uh, and then there's the portable units as well. I know there's the PXS1000, PXS3000. Uh, the Privia line, which uh, is what the PX uh, really kind of stands for, uh, has been a model lineup that Casio has been working on for many years. Uh, and as I've mentioned in a few of my other reviews, I am uh, genuinely impressed at where they have uh, been able to get themselves to in terms of fit and finish of the product and just the overall musical performance of um, the, the Privia products that are available out there. So the PX870 I had fairly high hopes for just because of the past experience of the PX770 as well as what I've seen out of the more recent S1000 and S3000 uh, versions of this, both in terms of the tone generator, the quality of the uh, amplifiers and the speakers they're putting on there, uh, all of the above. Uh, the PX870 in that regard, uh, I think, delivers very, very nicely for its price point. Uh, so let's run down what that means. First of all, we're talking about a tone generator uh, that delivers 256 notes of polyphony, um, you know, polyphony is becoming a little less relevant, generally speaking, these days because most of the high-end manufacturers are putting out product that all have more than sufficient polyphony. This used to be a big deal when computing technology was more expensive and it was uh, a lot more difficult for a manufacturer to deliver high polyphony without the cost being, you know, through the roof. These days, it's almost a given that the polyphony is going to be something pretty decent if it's an up-to-date product. 256, though, for what it's worth, is on the high side. Uh, and if you want to know what polyphony is, then stop the uh, video right now, open up another tab, and just Google Miriam Polyphony, and you will come up with a short video in which we talk about exactly what polyphony means. Basically, uh, the short story is it's the number of uh, notes that something can simultaneously process. And so 256 notes all at one time before this thing runs out of gas and starts shutting those notes down. There's no realistic uh, playing scenario where that really is ever going to happen. Um, there are a pair of 20 watt speakers on this instrument. And one of the uh, things I've noticed uh, that digital piano companies are doing these days, it's kind of a cheat but it legitimately improves the sound as it reaches your ear. So in this case, we've got two speakers which are facing the ground. However, the back of those speakers, which still actually does give off some sound, normally just gets lost in the cabinet. Uh, and it's not the best defined sound, but there is some ambient uh, you know, uh, tone projection that comes out of the back of a speaker cone. And so what uh, companies have done these days is they've started finding really interesting ways and spots to put vents where you can hear indirectly the back of that. And it almost kind of is like the poor man's tweeter. Uh, it's obviously not as direct and it's not as clear as an actual tweeter, but it does give the ear a slightly more direct um, method of hearing uh, that active speaker. Instead of just hearing it as a reflection off the floor, you've got these little 
tone ports, let's call them. I don't know if Casio has an official name for them, uh, but they're basically uh, just holes where you can still hear some ambient sound off the back uh, of that speaker. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and it helps a, a few more of those high-end frequencies reach your ear. So we've got a pair of 20-watt speakers. We've got 256 notes of polyphony. That tone generator on the 256 is also delivering a multi-dimensional uh, sample, let's, uh, shall we say. Now, when you only have two speakers in the first place, this kind of just becomes a signal processing uh, game, uh, really, because it's not as though you've been able to record a real piano or simulate a real piano with three or four different tone sources, uh, and then that's being uh, kind of re-presented or re-manifested through three or four uh, different um, uh, speakers themselves. However, uh, it does seem to add it some additional uh, kind of dimensionality uh, to the stereo field uh, to have this whatever Casio specifically means by the multi-dimensional thing. Normally it means that you've uh, captured a sample uh, with more than just a left and a right uh, microphone and somehow that's being processed uh, through your speaker array. And then moving on from the basic specs, this instrument is equipped with 19 or 20 or so uh, sounds and the quality of the sounds on the Casio is becoming quite impressive. There are aspects of the tone on the Casio that I think are done as well as some similar tones that you would get out of the Kawhi, out of the Roland, out of the Yamaha in a similar price range. Uh, and so in the Canadian market, this instrument is going to be uh, very similarly priced, uh, maybe just a little bit below where, say, a Kawhi KDP 110 is with extremely similar wattage. Uh, where do I think uh, an instrument like the, uh, the Kawai still maybe has a bit of an edge? I think the acoustic piano tone that the Kawai is generating or a uh, similarly priced Roland uh, with the uh, Supernatural engine, uh, it's probably, or to my ear, it's still processing some of the finer details of the piano tone uh, with a little bit more... Um, uh, definition and a little bit more accuracy, but it's pretty darn close considering where you know Casio was 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, to say that they're definitely uh, up in the pack uh, is a fair statement, and I would say for some of the more basic Yamaha acoustic piano sounds that I've heard out there, and maybe the number two or number three sound on the Roland. Uh, or even, say, the uh, Kawai from, say, the ES-110, this is very, very, very competitive. It's a super impressive product. Uh, so let's play a little bit just so you can hear exactly what it is that we are talking about. So uh, the first tone that I'm going to play uh, is the Grand Piano Concert Sound. Uh, and here we go. Lots of character, lots of warmth in that sample for sure. Uh, moving on to some of the other ones, uh, for example, the Mellow Grand Piano. Quite a dynamic difference between those two patches. And then 
on to bright. continue on. What's great, and you can't necessarily see this from the angle, but uh, Casio has a nice cheat sheet that's sitting just behind the black keys uh, permanently on the instrument. It's pretty subtle. It doesn't necessarily detract from the aesthetic appeal of the instrument, and I do think that it's quite an attractive cabinet, uh, but it's there and it makes it very easy to navigate this thing without having to have a screen. Um, so, modern... and jazz. And then we get into the E piano sounds. And some FM piano. And harpsichord. Well, nope, that's vibes. And then that'll be harpsichord. Not exactly the most authentic harpsichord sample I could have played, I realized that. Uh, strings. And pipe organ. That's actually a nice clean pipe organ. Side note, I really hate when digital pianos, and it usually only happens in the uh, kind of the lower price ranges, throw on all of this crazy distortion as a part of the organ sample to make it sound somehow more like a cathedral, like you've got the, the mixtures on, and so that's causing kind of a natural acoustic distortion. But they throw on this weird other effect that's supposed to simulate it, but it really doesn't. Um, what's nice is Casio doesn't have it. It's just a nice, clean pipe organ sound. It's actually pretty good. Yeah. Mm. And let's get back to there. So there's a few misses in there, but generally speaking, I would say I'm really quite happy with a lot of the tones that are in that, uh, the Casio PX870. So before we move on to the action, just to sum up the highlights of what we're talking about from the tone production, the fact that this has a pair of 20 watt speakers on it 
makes it uh, one of the more powerful instruments in its class. The other one that comes, uh, it's exactly the same spec, would be the Kawai that also has a pair of 20 watt uh, stereo speakers. So you may have a preference between one or the two in terms of just the overall character that the speakers and the amplifiers uh, present to you. But in terms of overall capability, uh, it's, it's nice to see another instrument other than the Kawai in that range, providing that kind of power at that kind of price range. 256 notes of polyphony, as I said, polyphony is becoming a little less relevant in uh, home digital pianos than it was 10 years ago when you still had some instruments coming out with 64 notes of polyphony or 96 notes of polyphony. It's not as big a deal now because really if you're playing just solo piano, 128 and up is usually pretty sufficient and even if you're starting to do some layering, 196 is plenty, uh, 256 is, is almost to a point a bit overkill. Uh, so that's all we're going to talk about for sound. Next we're uh, going to cover the action uh, and then finally in the third uh, segment we're going to talk about some of the other features that the PX870 offers. So moving on to action but first we'll uh, just get a couple of those specs up on the screen for you. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll be back in just a second. Casio has done a few things with their actions over the last few years, and I would say some of them have been successful, some of them have been a little bit odd, uh, but for the most part, I think they are moving in the direction of producing a really consistent, high quality, and uh, honestly, very musically satisfying action in the majority of the instruments that they put out there. The AP, or sorry, the PX870, uh, uses a, a tri-sensor action, it's a triple sensor action, so it's quite accurate in terms of its MIDI output. Uh, you find that that can really increase uh, the accuracy if you're using this as a controller. Also it increases or reduces the chance of kind of weird double hitting if you are doing uh, some really aggressive, uh, you know, repetitive notes. Without any kind of like weird uh, spikes, MIDI spikes. Uh, so that uh, can be quite handy. Um, it uh, doesn't have escapement, uh, which is not unusual uh, for this price range. Um, as an example, uh, the Yamaha in this price range doesn't, the Kawai in this price range doesn't. Uh, I think the Roland in this price range is pretty much the only one that does have escapement. Uh, and that would be like the F140 or the RP102 that uses the PHA4 action. Um, but another thing that they've done, and they were uh, really, I would say, ahead of the curve a little bit on this, was they started to put uh, pretty dramatic textures on the keys, which tried at a much higher level to simulate the actual te texture that you were getting on an acoustic key. I remember uh, seeing this on a PX160. Oh man, this would have been like 2015 or 2016 before it really became quite popular to do this amongst the major brands with their black key having this very pronounced ebony wood simulated texture on it uh, and a pretty dramatic ivory texture on the key as well. And this was on, you know, like a six, seven hundred dollar keyboard. I said, well, what the heck is this? Uh, it's now become pretty standard practice for all the Casios to have this uh, sort of over accentuated texture. And there's times that I really enjoy it. Sometimes I don't even notice it. And there's a few times where it, I, I, it takes a little bit of getting used to. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is when the Privias are right out of the box, when they're brand, brand, brand new, I find the black keys to be too slippery. Uh, I find it goes away pretty quickly. So if you were trying one in a store and you find the black key is too slippery for your liking, it would be worth asking the salesperson if this was something that was just recently unboxed or whether it's been out for a while. I mean, if it's been out for a while and you still think the black key is too slippery, it may be just not the instrument for you. Uh, but what I have found is after a couple of hours of playing, sometimes even less than that, those black keys start to pick up a little bit of uh, oil off, off of your hand and that slipperiness goes away and you're left with a really nice texture which feels pretty similar to if you were playing uh, an unfinished ebony key. Uh, and there's a few grand pianos that, that do this and so you might be used to uh, how that feels. Uh, same thing with the uh, white key on the ivory, although I don't notice it as much on the white key. But anyway, we've got this nice texture on the white key and on the black key. We've got the triple sensor uh, and Generally, the one thing that I uh, notice a lot about the current generation of this action 
uh, that Casio is using is it feels a lot more solid and a lot, I can feel a lot less uh, unwanted motion in the key action part. So there's no rattle. Uh, it doesn't feel like I can really like move my you know fingers around in an, in an undue way. Uh, the lateral motion is well controlled. There's not weird clicks. Um, I would say that this action is going to be an action which ages uh, fairly well, very much in line uh, with like a compact uh, hammer action from like a Kawai or a GH action from a Yamaha, although I like this a lot better than the GHS action on the Yamaha. I find that there's a little more give and I find that the feel is just a bit more realistic. This is not the action that is in the PXS 1000, I should mention, uh, or the 3000. And I know that on some of those other Casio models that there was a whole to do, uh, you know, floating around online uh, about how the black keys uh, actually technically weighted out heavier uh, than the white keys. And there were some people that were quite uh, bothered by this. Um, when I played those instruments, I found that I could, if I really paid attention to it, uh, tell that there was a slight difference uh, in the, the weight of the black key from what I was expecting to feel. But the, generally, it really didn't take away from the playing experience. And I seriously doubt that anyone who is trying to achieve a super high level of, say, classical playing uh, is buying a $700 keyboard from Casio to tackle that anyway. Uh, so for its application and the intended customer, I didn't find it a big deal. But for what it's worth, this is not that action. And I don't uh, find that the black keys on this uh, instrument feel um, any different than what they should. Uh, and the weighting overall uh, is slightly on the heavier side. So if you're somebody who actually prefers a digital piano that feels a little uh, beefier, uh, you may actually appreciate uh, that action. So anyway, I'm going to put a few specs about the action up there and then we will be back with our final section talking about some of the other features that are available on this instrument, in including the Cordana app. And we are going to get the uh, smartphone um, all wired up there so we can play around with that as well. So thanks so much for still being with us. We'll see you in a couple minutes. There are a few interesting features that are available in the PX870. I wouldn't say that they are unusual for the price point. At this point, they're being, they're, it's kind of an expected feature that an instrument around uh, this price, we're talking thousand US dollars, you know, 1400 uh, Canadian dollars, something in that range, is going to have some recording capability. This has the ability to record both uh, MIDI as well as audio uh, to USB. Uh, this has uh, quite a few built-in uh, songs, and that's something that I'm noticing more and more manufacturers are beefing up their library. I think the feedback that we're getting from our customers, but they also must be getting from their customers, uh, is that it's quite engaging. It's a really fun way to play, to have these songs built into the piano that you can interact with, these classical tunes, because it sort of creates the illusion that you're able to play them at a high level before you actually are. It's almost, it, you kind of get, it simulates the feeling of success before you would otherwise feel that good about it if you were just playing on an acoustic piano uh, and uh, kind of soldiering through it on your own uh, without uh, this type of backup. So uh, on this instrument, there are three or four dozen uh, fairly well-known songs that are built into uh, the keyboard that allow you to play uh, with it, interact with it in a couple of different ways. You can shut off and turn on what the left hand is supposed to be doing, what the right hand is supposed to be doing. Um, you can uh, simply listen to it. You can have it so it's actually kind of grading you a little bit. Uh, and that's where the Cordana app uh, comes in. So I'm going to just quickly start a screen record here. So I've got the uh, screen recording up here. And uh, what we've got here is the Maple Leaf Rag. And you have the option of having just the score, uh, kind of those trailing notes that you see on YouTube all over the place, or both. I have it on both. And here's a good example of what it allows you to do. Now, as I attempted to play along, I would 
not get good points for that. But you can see that um, as I play, the digital keys on the screen are playing along. And so if you were using a larger tablet, this would be a lot uh, more engaging. I would say it's not particularly useful for this application when you're using it on a smartphone. On a tablet, I could see this being a very different uh, scenario. And that's where you can turn uh, both the left hand off and the right hand off. You can change the tempo, uh, which for me on that probably would be the merciful thing to do. Uh, and then you can also get into tone selection. So you can use the Cordana app uh, to select uh, the um, instrument that you want to use. And by the looks of this, this almost looks as though it's got the GM2 sound bank on it. Oh, I see. Not quite. So the GM2 sound bank is actually inside the app. It's not inside the instrument. So you can select the very the tone that you want the app to be using. Gotcha. So that's how that works. So not all features of the Cordana app are available uh, for every single instrument. There's some instruments that are gonna have some enabled, some that don't have it enabled. So be sure to check out Casio's website for specifics if this is like a big part of your shopping and decision process is what that app can do. Um, the instrument comes with its built-in, own built-in stand and triple pedal system, which is great. Doesn't come with a included bench, so that is something you're going to have to budget for if you are comparing it to other instruments that do, in fact, come with its own uh, bench. Uh, it comes with two headphone jacks without any uh, stereo quarter inch out. That's going to be a big deal for some people. It's not going to make any difference for some other people. That's You'll just have to uh, decide whether that is, in fact, a big deal. Uh, this doesn't have any Bluetooth connection. Um, but as you can see, we are using this uh, with uh, a USB cable to connect it to the device, and then it's got a USB available connection uh, that you can use to connect it to a computer uh, for uh, MIDI transfer uh, and the like. Of course, the basics are covered, metronome, transpose, octave shift, you can layer two sounds at once, you can split the instrument into two sounds. I know those are fairly standard features, but it never hurts to remind people that it that, that is available. Uh, and then it's got a dust cover, uh, which is a very handy thing. So, and I must say that the quality of the cabinet it really impressed me when I was putting this together. Uh, and yes, I do actually put some of these together. Uh, the uh, connection points that were in there, uh, the way in which uh, this all pulls together, it results in a really secure uh, you know, instrument. And the way that they package these main, means that I would be very uh, surprised if the Casios had very much shipping damage generally out there. Uh, really well packaged and nicely put together as well. So in summary, what do we have? We've got an instrument in that sweet spot, that between $1,000 to $2,000 price range. And uh, compared to some of the other uh, instruments out on the market, I think what you have is a, a piano tone, which is definitely above average. I think you've got an action, which is definitely above average. I think the action is gonna be a little more specific to the player. Uh, really hard for me to know whether the, the vast majority of people are going to like or not like an action like this. Um, and I guess where I'm coming from is it's a slightly heavier action where you've got an exaggerated texture. Uh, for people who, uh, yeah, it's a very personal thing. You're just going to have to try that and find out whether it does it for you. Um, but a nice solid set of speakers, a pair of 20 watt stereo speakers, so lots of power and a very well made cabinet that is going to give you a lot of years of use. So if you are in that price range uh, and you hadn't yet considered Casio, I think it's worthwhile to try and get to a showroom where you can play one of these next to, say, a Yamaha P125 uh, or a um, 
in Arius uh, YDP144 uh, is probably a, a good comparison. I think a fair comparison with the Kawhi would probably be the KDP110. Uh, uh, and on the Roland side, this is going to fare quite well against something like uh, the RP-102. Some pros and cons there, Roland does have some, some great Bluetooth connectivity uh, there that some of the other companies uh, don't. But definitely worth a consideration. I think it's fair to say uh, that the top three or the, the, the big three manufacturers in this space being Kawhi, Yamaha, and Roland uh, really are not the only ones that should and could be considered in this price range uh, anymore. Very, very uh, happy and impressed with a lot that the PX870 has to offer, particularly with the quality of the piano tone uh, and how just how comfortable and how solid the action feels. So, thank you so much for joining us for another review. My name is Stu Harrison. This has been the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. Please look out for other videos where we start to do some comparisons of the PX870. Uh, we'll definitely be comparing it with that Kawhi KDP 110 that I mentioned a few times uh, in the video. Uh, and subscribe to the channel. We'd love to see you back uh, for more. Join our ever-growing community of piano lovers and hit that notification bell because we are always coming out with new videos every single week to help you enjoy pianos and shop for them a little bit better. Thanks so much, and we will see you soon. Sun is right.